Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, thanks, Liz, for introducing that. And so what I'd like to do is, um, this turned out to be sort of a structural biologist dream. You know, sometimes we solve structures and then we look at it and it's like, we still don't know what's going on. Um, and this one, you know, we don't know what's going on, but it presents a lot of hypotheses that we can now test. And so uh, we're working on testing them. And what I'd like to do is sort of talk about what those hypotheses are. Uh, so this is the structure that, that Liz just introduced. Um, oh, and um, as Liz mentioned, um, in the high resolution maps, uh, we can clearly see the, the double-stranded upstream RNA. We see the, temp, the product RNA, the red strand um, in the active site. The, the polymerase is in a post-translocated conformation. So if we had added an NTP, it would go in um, to the site right here. Um, but we didn't really see, we could see really spotty density going into the helicase. But if we um, low pass filter a difference map, we can get a really a low resolution view of the RNA uh, that's clearly uh, the five prime end of the template strand, which is in cyan, coming out of the active site and then going into the helicase. Only one of the helicases, this one we call NSB 13.1. And as Eric alluded to, and, and Liz talked about this, this presents sort of a conundrum because the polymerase is, is translocating on the blue strand in the three prime to five prime direction while it's synthesizing the red strand in the five prime to three prime direction. But the helicase travels in the five prime to three prime direction also on the blue strand. So they're, they're sort of at odds with each other. Um, and I think I have a movie here. Um, that just shows you a different view of the same thing. The RNA, the template, the five prime end of the template strand is, is clearly coming out of the active site and going into the, into, the, uh, into the translocation module of the helicase. And again, they go, they're going in opposite directions. And you know, one of the reviewers for our paper didn't, didn't really believe that this was the RNA. But now that we have, we've actually collected a much larger data set of these particles, the overall resolution of the whole structure is 2.9 instead of three and a half. And now that we have a lot more particles, we can classify different conformations of the helicase and, and we have one structural class where we can very clearly see the RNA um, going through the active site of the helicase. So this is definitely the five prime end of the template. So what, what um, does that mean that the helicase and the polymerase are bound to the same strand of RNA and going in opposite directions? If the helicase wins this sort of competition, um, it could actually push the polymerase backwards. And uh, as Liz mentioned earlier, we work on the, the cellular DNA dependent RNA polymerases. And this sort of backwards motion is, uh, is a very common thing for us to think about. Uh, it's called backtracking, and I'd like to talk a little bit about backtracking in the DNA-dependent RNA polymerases before I get into the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So um, this was around uh, the end, around 1997. A couple of groups, Mikhail Kashlev and Evgeny Nudler, um, described this phenomenon biochemically. Actually, it was first presented by Mikhail at a at a at a, at a meeting, and Nobody believed it. It was just like, why would the polymerase do this? Um, but you know, more and more evidence came out, and uh, it became very clear that what was going on. Um, this is a schematic of the cellular DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It's like a 400 kilodalton complex. It uses double-stranded DNA as a template. Um, it creates a transcription bubble. Um, within the bubble is the active site where there's a magnesium ion. As the enzyme is synthesizing the RNA transcript, the three prime end of the transcript makes an RNA DNA hybrid with the template strand. But then the, the hybrid is disrupted by the protein and the, and the resulting product is single stranded RNA. And in this backtracking uh, phenomenon, what happens is the polymerase actually 
normally it's going left to right, one step at a time as it elongates the three prime end of the RNA. But in backtracking, the polymerase moves right to left. It goes backwards on the DNA template. And what happens is the transcription bubble moves backwards with the polymerase. And then since there's this long RNA-DNA hybrid between the RNA transcript and the template strand, um, that has to maintain register. So what happens is the RNA reverse threads through the complex. And this generates a single strand three prime fragment of RNA. These backtrack complexes are not catalytically active because the three prime hydroxyl of the RNA is, is no longer in the active site of the polymerase. Um, so let me illustrate this a little bit here. This is a structure from our lab of, a, of an E. coli RNA polymerase transcription elongation complex. Um, you're looking down on top of the polymerase. The beta subunit, actually here, is uh, in cyan. The large beta prime subunits in pink. These make sort of a big crab claw shape. And then the nucleic acids fit inside this active site cleft between the, the beta and beta prime inserts. So right here, what you see is the downstream DNA. This is the direction where the polymerase is going. This is upstream DNA. Right here is the transcription bubble. And the red here is the RNA transcript in this RNA-DNA hybrid that I talked about. And right here in yellow is the active site magnesium. So this structure is going to turn sideways. And I want to show you a feature of the structure here. Um, with, you have a channel up here called the, the, the downstream, where the duplex downstream DNA binds. But there's a, a feature of the structure um, that I forgot to point out. Uh, we call it the bridge helix. It's this magenta colored helix. It's a part of the beta prime subunit. And it sort of divides the main channel into two compartments. This compartment where the downstream duplex DNA goes. But then underneath the bridge helix, there's another channel. We call this the secondary channel, or in the eukaryotic polymerases, which are very conserved in structure, uh, they call this the funnel. And you see in this movie that the secondary channel or the funnel sort of provides a, a conduit that goes straight into the acrocyte. You see the acrocyte magnesium, you see the three prime end of the RNA here. And if we slice into the polymerase, you can see this architecture. Here's the bridge helix that we've cut in half. The template strand goes over the top of the bridge helix, but underneath the bridge helix, you have this channel. And we know that NTP substrates during elongation, this is how they enter the complex. But during backtracking, uh, remember I told you that uh, if the enzyme travels backwards, the RNA reverse threads through the complex. And you can see from this architecture that the RNA has no choice but to go out this, this secondary channel. Uh, so this is where the three prime single strand fragment of the backtrack RNA would go. And that was realized very early on uh, once there was a structure from cross-linking evidence. And now there are structures of backtrack complexes of both eukaryotic and bacterial polymerases. So I'm going to show you this movie from Patrick Kramer's group. This is actually Paul II but it's very highly conserved in structure with the E. coli enzyme. Now the bridge helix is green. You see the template DNA going over the top of the bridge helix and the downstream duplex DNA. Here's the RNA DNA hybrid. The active site magnesium is magenta here. And this is just showing what happens when the enzyme backtracks. It's moving backwards on the DNA. The RNA reverse threads and the three prime end of the transcript extrudes out this secondary channel or funnel. OK. So um, I'm going to talk about why this happens. Um, it's actually not just sort of a curious artifact of the polymerase. This is actually a functionally important feature of the polymerase. Uh, one thing is that the active site uh, is able to perform endonucleotic cleavage of the RNA. And there are factors in the cell, GRI A, GRI B, and bacteria, or TF2S in eukaryotes, that greatly stimulate this endonucleotic cleavage. So it's actually a proofreading mechanism. So if 
a, a base, a nucleotide is misincorporated into the RNA, it's, it ends up in the RNA-DNA hybrid and that encourages backtracking actually. So the, the fragment of RNA that has the misincorporation in it is extruded out the secondary channel. The, the, the three prime fragment of RNA that has the misincorporation in it is cleaved. And then there's a new three prime hydroxyl generated in the active site and the polymerase can try again and, until it gets it right. That's one role of backtracking in the, in the cellular RNA polymerases. So here's a view of the RNA dependent RNA polymerase from SARS. It's not structurally, it's not evolutionarily related to the DNA dependent RNA polymerases whatsoever. Um, as Liz described, you see here the thumb, the NSP12, the RD, RDRP subunit, the cofactors NSP8, NSP7. And here's the three prime end of the uh, trend of the of the elongating RNA. But if you turn the structure a little bit, you see this again, you see the secondary, this channel that goes right into the active site. And there's a structural feature that divides the channel into two compartments. It's not a bridge helix anymore. It's a it's a beta hairpin. It's actually motif F um, of these conserved elements of the of the polymerase. It directs the template RNA in blue over the top. And underneath, just like in the DDRPs, you see this channel that goes straight into the active site. And so if this enzyme were to move backwards and backtrack, the RNA would have no choice but to reverse thread out this, out this channel here. Okay. Here's another view of the E. coli elongation complex and uh, the, the direction of travel of the backtracked RNA. And you have a very similar structural architecture, although it's not evolutionarily conserved, you have this sort of fork in the road, so to speak, and the RNA has to go out this channel. So again, I mentioned if, if the helicase is engaged with the template and it's translocating in the reverse direction, our hypothesis is that if this RNA uh, if the RNA polymerase misincorporates, um, the, this causes issues with incorporation of the next NTP, the polymerase likely stalls or pauses. This allows, this gives the helicase a chance to engage with the template RNA, and it can actually push the polymerase backwards, and we think this may play a role in proofreading. So, um, oh, I wanna mention one more thing. Um, Backtracking for the cellular RNA polymerase, the DNA dependent RNA polymerase is sort of, it's very easy. It's energetically neutral uh, because when the enzyme backtracks, the, the transcription bubble stays the same. The RNA DNA hybrid stays the same. You, you melt duplex DNA upstream, but you re anneal duplex DNA downstream. So you're not really changing how many base pairs there are. Um, and so, you know, other than sort of minor variations in sequence context, the energetic energetics of backtracking are sort of relatively neutral. But for the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, if it's if it's elongating on a single-stranded RNA template, if it backtracks, you're only melting duplex RNA. You're not recovering duplex RNA anywhere. So this is not favorable, and that's why we think we need the helicase to provide ATP power, HP hydrolysis power to help the polymerase backtrack. So why would the polymerase want to backtrack? One I've already mentioned is proofreading. And another one has to do with this template switching that happens during subgenomic transcription. So first I'd like to talk a little bit about proofreading. Um, this is a, from a paper of, of Gorbalinas where they uh, classified positive strand RNA viruses. These are the these illustrate the different orders of viruses, and these are the um, genome sizes and kilobases. And you see these needle viruses sort of really stand out by having these gigantic um, RNA genomes. And it was hypothesized as soon as these these large RNA genomes were discovered, um, people wondered how this was possible because. This family of RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is very error-prone. 
and it would it would not be possible for the RNA for the viruses to maintain these genomes without sort of mutation catastrophes, without some extra um, um, proofreading capabilities. And it turns out that's indeed the case. These nidoviruses, all of the positive strand RNA viruses that have genomes greater than 20 kb, they encode what's called a proofreading activity. It's encoded in this heterodimer between NSP10 and NSP14. And this NSP14 protein has a three prime to five prime exonuclease activity that's known to play a role in proofreading. So if you knock out this exon activity, um, the virus uh, can still replicate, but it, it has much higher, like many orders of magnitude higher mutation frequency. And for example, this is a study from Mark Dennison's group that shows if you knock out this exonuclease activity, the coronavirus has become very, very much more sensitive to nucleotide analogs, for instance, because they can no longer be uh, edited out by the exonuclease activity. So this proofreading is very important for the virus. Um, but what's curious is in this structure of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, the three prime end of the of the primer or product RNA is, is buried inside the polymerase. So there's no way that the uh, active site of the, the exonuclease active site of NSV14 can, can access this, this three prime end of the RNA. It's not sterically possible. And so this points out a role, possible role of backtracking. I mentioned already if the enzyme misincorporates, it likely pauses or stalls in its elongation activity. That gives the helicase, which would be up here, a chance to engage with the template RNA and it can push the polymerase backwards. That would extrude the three prime end of the RNA that has the misincorporation out the secondary channel. And then the exonuclease activity of NSP14 can, can access and edit the mistake there. So this is a hypothesis and we're, we're you know, busy testing this hypothesis. And so I'd like to try to explain now another possible role of backtracking. Um, and that has to do with this funny uh, subgenomic transcription and template switching that these coronaviruses do. So um, it's actually known that um, the three prime end of the genome and the five prime end of the genome um, interact with each other. It's hypothesized that there's a, a protein complex that sort of holds this thing together in like a big circle. It's not known what these proteins are, um, but what happens during this subgenomic transcription of the structural, the viral structural proteins, which are located at the three prime end of the, of the genome. Uh, the RNA dependent RNA polymerase loads at the three prime end of the genome and starts transcribing uh, five prime to three prime. And there are these sequences located um, at the beginning of each of these structural genes called transcription regulatory sequences, TRSs, that are colored in orange here. Um, and there's also a TRS uh, after the five prime leader of the genome. And when the RNA polymerase transcribes one of these TRS sequences, um, it's hypo the RNA polymerase is supposed to be this uh, hexagon thing, uh, actually octagon thing here. Um, no, hexagon. <laughs> Once the, this TRS sequence is, is transcribed, uh, it's known that the polymerase stalls transcription and it's known that um, two things can either happen. Either the polymerase uh, can read through and continue transcribing the, the genome here, but also what can happen with a certain frequency is that the, the polymerase will seem to switch templates and it will start transcribing uh, a sequence complementary to the five prime, in, five prime leader of the genome. Uh, and this template switching is, is absolutely dependent on um, base pair complementary complementarity between this TRS and the TRS at the five prime end of the genome. So it's presumed that there's base pairing has to happen between the RNA transcript and the, five, the TRS at the five prime end of the genome. So how can this happen? Um, I'll get to that in a second. I'm, I'm gonna summarize here, I'm, I'm close to the end now. 
Um, this describes our structure. We think um, our structure is sort of an equilibrium between several states. One of these states is the RNA, the five prime end of the template RNA is sort of free, but in, in another state, the RNA is engaged with the helicase. And that's why, um, because it's not fully occupied, we don't have a perfect structure, the, the structure that's published right at the moment. Um, Liz mentioned earlier that the helicase has always been presumed to play a role in sort of removing downstream obstacles to elongation of the polymerase. We don't, we don't have evidence. Nobody has evidence for this, uh, but it could play a role in um, either engaging with downstream hairpins on the single strand template in this way, and that would uh, melt these hairpins and allow the polymerase to uh, transcribe through these regions. This sort of activity would be distributive. So once this hairpin was melted, the helicase would have to let go so the polymerase could keep going. Alternatively, if the, if the template is duplex RNA, um, the helicase could engage with the, with the other strand, which is shown in green. And then the helicase and the polymerase are, are going in the right directions on their two respective strands. And this could work very processively um, if, if the template was duplex, which it might be um, if, the, if the polymerase uh, copies the negative strand of the, of the RNA, then um, it's thought there might be a duplex between the negative and positive strands. And then that has to be replicated to make more copies of the positive strand. But what I want to talk about is this subgenomic transcription. So as I showed you before in that diagram, the polymerase transcribes the red RNA here until it reaches a TRS. The TRS is transcribed, but then uh, the polymerase stalls. Probably play, playing a role in this are other proteins that assemble here to keep the five prime end of the genome and the three prime end together, but they're, they're not shown here. When this polymerase stalls, we think that gives an opportunity for the helicase to engage uh, with, the, with the template RNA. And that would uh, allow the helicase to translocate in the opposite direction and backtrack this, this polymerase. And that would expose the three prime end of the RNA and the, the complementary sequence of the TRS would be exposed here. And that would allow this sequence to base pair with the TRS sequence in the, at the five prime leader of the genome, which we know is really important for this template switching. What happened now, we think, is that um, this first complex uh, could continue backtracking, and that would actually peel off the transcript from uh, the genome, so you end up with a single-stranded transcript. That's, which, there's two minutes left. OK, this is like the last slide. Um, you need to end up with a single-strand RNA product here, because this RNA has to be copied in the opposite direction, and that serves as an mRNA for the structural proteins of the virus. It's, it's like mind-bogglingly complex. But anyway, this complex we think backtracks or maybe releases, but now we're left with this uh, three prime, five prime fork that we think a second polymerase can load on, um, the same way that the polymerase loads onto this kind of RNA construct. And that second polymerase can continue Whoop, can continue transcription of the transcript, uh, synthesizing a sequence that's complementary to the five prime leader of the genome. And so you end up with this template switching phenomenon that's known to be important for generating the mRNAs for these structural proteins. So this backtracking, uh, the helicase may play a role in removing obstacles for RNA polymerase elongation. Uh, we think it plays a really important role in exposing the three prime end of the RNA for proofreading. And then we hypothesize it plays a role in, in this uh, template switching process that's also critical for generating mRNAs for the structural proteins of the virus. Um, and Liz already showed this slide. Um, again, uh, a shout out to Brandon and James who really uh, did the heavy lifting for this project or with a lot of help from Eliza. Um, here's Liz. I'm not sure if she's really tired here or she's like 
head slapping because I've said something really stupid. Um, Luna didn't really help much in this project. <laughs> and here's some better pictures of Liz, Eliza, James, um, and a shout out to Young Youngju Choi, who's uh, joined the lab as a research assistant and is working on this project now. And Liz already uh, mentioned um, Michael Grasso and Patrick Shelton from Tarun Kapoor's lab, who cloned and, and helped us work with the helicase and did all the biochemical studies of the helicase, the ATPase activity and, and unwinding activity of the helicase. Uh, Dominic from Brian Chait's laboratory, who did the native mass spec. Uh, we actually find um, there's a really good correlation between native mass spec results and and whether or not we can get a good cryo-EM structure of a complex. And Hassan from Tom Tush's laboratory um, happened to have a clone of NSB12 that we used for our studies. And Keshab and Ed Eng from the New York Structural Biology Center uh, helped us collect uh, this data. And we had a lot of help from other people, some other members of Tarun's lab, uh, Charlie Rice, as Liz mentioned, Mark Ibrahim in our Cryo-EM Resource Center here at, on campus, um, another member of the Structural Biology Center, um, and some really great discussions with Jim Berger and Bob Landick um, about the, the functional, the biological implications of this structure, and the other members uh, of our lab. So thank you very much, I'm, I'm done there. Uh, thank you, Seth. Um, that was a fantastic talk. Um, we have a question um, from the audience, but I wanted to ask something very quickly first. Um, so the way you've depicted it, you, the, the, the helicases are always associated with the polymerase, at least in the drawings. And I'm wondering if you could comment on how um, the helicase might be regulated. I'm presuming sometimes it's off, sometimes it's on and if you have any insight into that. Right, um, so we don't know about, yeah, maybe other proteins bind there and block the helicase from binding. Um, we, don't, we don't have any insight to that right now. There are a lot of other proteins implicated in binding NSP8, as Liz pointed out at the beginning, from sort of protein-protein interaction studies. So it's possible that there's a, you know, a lot of exchange going on there. But we do have some insight from our, our new studies that I, I, we're still analyzing the results. But what, what we see there is that when we classify the confirmations of the, of the helicases, um, one really prominent confirmation of the helicases is, is, is sort of in a confirmation that it wouldn't be able to um, translocate on the RNA. So another possibility is that um, the helicase is sort of in, a, in an inactive confirmation most of the time, but it only engages with the RNA when it needs to. But what the signal for that confirmation switch is, we, we don't really know either. So that's all I can really say about that right now. Okay. And so uh -oh. Kate can get up and going. Um, we have a question from... Uh, Jonathan Dworkin, and Jonathan, you should be able to talk now. Yeah, great. Hi, Seth. Hey. Hey, great, great talk, and Liz's talk was great, too. I have a quick question for you about the backtracking and proofreading. So do you think that backtracking is essential for proofreading, or it's a sort of a, an accessory part of the mechanism? So the proofreading cannot happen if the polymerase is engaged with the, the three prime end of the of the RNA. So I there it either has to backtrack so that the exonucleus can access the three prime end, or the polymerase has to dissociate. And so the the NS the NSP14 activity might be working on the RNA if the polymerase falls off. So those are the two possibilities. I don't I don't see any way for it to work if the polymerase is still there, but not backtrack, unless the RNA comes out some other way that, that we don't know about. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks, that's very clear. So the, the thinking in the field, if you read a lot of reviews, that 
this NSV10, NSV14 heterodimer is a part of the RTC and it just sort of travels, it stably binds to the polymerase and just travels along with it all the time. But we haven't been able to get a stable complex and I don't think anyone else has either because there would be a structure if they, if they right. <laughs> and so um, there's something either missing, we don't have the right RNA construct or it doesn't actually work that way. Um, it could be unstable, presumably, but that would be, or, you know, things could be just jostling around. In yeah, that. it hops, it hops on and off. As yeah. Yeah. yeah, cool. All right, thanks. Seth, could I ask, is there, is there any evidence of alternative proofreading that we're used to with RT, which is one base at a time, just backing off one, removing one misincorporated base? We think that works for ACT. So, um, I don't actually know in vivo in the virus how it, how it works. We just know that if you, the evidence that I know of is if you knock out exonucleus activity, the mutation frequency, you know, goes through the roof. But I don't know exactly in vivo how the proofreading is working. We know if the, so the NSP14, the exonucleus activity is really robust. So. Um, all the studies we've been trying to do with it is with a mutant that's inactive. Because if you add wild type NSP14 to any of our constructs, the RNA just gets destroyed and there's no more <laughs> RNA left. <laughs> so, so this is presumably the major proofreading mechanism for this guy anyway, rather than some, you know, uh, single base guy. Right. I don't think the RNA polymerase itself is known to have any proofreading activity. Right, right. I'm not getting it, yeah. Okay. 